It says I'm live. Okay, I don't see anything. Oh, wait, that right. Okay. I'm going to take those off this time. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, oh, all right. I'm going to open up. I'm going to open this up. I don't know that it's going to help all of us because I feel like me and Emily are the only ones that knows that I'm secretly going live now. And then Ollie, you're going to freak out because you're like, you didn't tell us that you're going live. Oh God, it says I'm live now. Okay. I'm going to click it and then I'm going to see. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Oh, God, I got to turn that off. Oh, all right. Okay. That was exciting. Now, there was a lag last time, but then when I posted the video, there wasn't a lag. So I'm just going to keep rocking like there's not a lag, and I'm going to try to not pay attention to that. But I don't know that I'm going to see your questions. So we're just practicing. I mean, I'm going to lecture. We're just practicing. Emily, you need to tell me what I need to do next to, like, see your comments, I guess, if there are any. <gasps> Kayla. Is that my Kayla? I got a notification for it. Good. Welcome. Y'all, somebody else got, uh, like, you should watch this video for, like, Emily helped me. I cannot imagine anybody watching that, but my face, oh, my face. Um, all right, so I'm still looking. I just saw Kayla. Kayla. No, but we can't have. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn. Okay, so that was a lot of skin going. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go over all of 12-3, even though we've already lectured on 12-3 for the most part, but I think it's just going to be easier to just go from the beginning, and uh, and we'll just, I'll post every section. We'll start a section, we'll end a section, and then you guys can, I mean, you can text me, you can, God forbid, call me, you can um, email me, and we'll just go from here. So, I wish I could see y'all, because again, it's like, it's giving me in a box. It's not very good. So, Again, if you guys were in class, you'd be saying, that's crop duster. And I'd be like, yeah, we're a whole bunch of farming people. Um, so, the remember, this is a very liberal class, book content sometimes. And so, this is telling us that this is so harmful for our environment. Um, and we would talk about how, yes, it is harmful, but what are our options? Like, are we going to not... Have as many people here. Uh, I like to eat. Fat girls like to eat. Um, and then we move on to our runoff, ruining our fresh water. Uh, there's not a lot of fresh water. Uh, and remember, we talked about there's 3% fresh water, and of that, we got our hands on 1%. And then once you start really, and, and look, guys, you know, you got to remember, 87% of all statistics are made up. So you got to kind of look at this and think, oh, okay, um, I might not die today. It, but if you go to the grocery stores and you're going to go try to buy some water, you may be convinced you're going to die today. But we're just going to step up our lip. We're going to keep going. Um, so this is telling us that our aquaculture, which is our agricultural people, um, are using 70% of our water to put on their farms. Um, and I want to remind you, you do get some of that, that water back when you eat. But it also uses 38% of the world's ice-free land. And if you remember in, I think, 12-2, we talked about cost rewards as far as, like, how much land are the cattle costing us versus how much payoff are we getting when we consume said delicious cattle. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions, if you remember, we talk about you know, the combines and the tractors and the driving back and forth and all those places, all of those things are taken into consideration when we come up with this percentage. And then 60% of all the water pollution. Yay! So, again, overall, 
This is giving us a bad feeling about our farmers, which we're not going to have because we love farmers and we love food and, you know, lots of it. Okay, topsoil. Now, I had you guys say an O horizon. And remember, the O horizon is organic and it's the, it's where all the good stuff's going to happen. So, this is the part that gets washed away. Uh, we can wash it away by wind. We can wash it away by water. I mean, those are the two primary uh, means with which we wash them away. We don't see things that look like this here in Owensboro because, you know, we don't live in places like that. I hope that if you are asked how to prevent a ton of this stuff, the answer is roots. Right. Not only is it an informational movie I hear um, but it's also you know really good to hold your top stool down and um, I loved our discussion about the wildflowers and um, just putting some grass out there that's nice um, we just we want to keep our top soil. so again roots all right this is just uh, just to kind of show you who is degrading their soil. Um, of course, red is bad. Red is always bad. And you'll see that pretty much everybody is degrading their soil to some extent. Uh, some of us worse than others. So when we lose that topsoil, we lose our fertility because that's, that's typically how far down our roots go and that's where our plants get their nutrients from. Uh, but the other thing we talked about was when this washes into our water systems. So you put all these chemicals, you put all these sediments, you put all of these vitamins and nutrients, or you found them. You didn't put them, but you found them. And then they go washing into the ditch. And then, you know, just like Nemo said, all streams end up in the ocean, or in our case, in the river, which, you know, then ends up in the ocean. So it ends up killing our fish, or like maybe you went fishing with like, you know, Uncle Cooter, and he got you like, I don't know, like a three-headed fish, or, you know, I don't know, like you saw Loch Ness. It is hard to say what happens on the Ohio. And so some people say that that is a part of our pollution problem, is, is we're washing those harmful things into our sediment. Um, now, this problem becomes worse if our topsoil contains pesticides. And then notice I have the word biomagnification there. And we've not really talked about biomagnification in its entirety yet, but we know what we do with those big scary words. We break them down, right? So bio means life, magnification, it's gonna make it bigger, right? So in biomagnification, it's where these, these living organisms carry typically in their fat, uh, these contaminants, and they don't, release them and so the more you eat then it, it accumulates in your tissue and it gets worse and worse and worse um, and fish are like popular for doing that so we don't have a lot of land that looks like this just naturally like walking around but i will tell you if you've ever been out during um, a flood and then the flood recedes and then this is kind of the look of that and so i appreciated the fact that they have um, drought does degrade, but also we could have this sort of look after, you know, after we've experienced something pretty terrible too. So dry lands and regions with arid and semi-arid climates occupy about 40% of the world's land area and are home to some 2 billion people. And that number is climbing. And then here's our other green belt. Um, and we watched these two videos about alternative things that we can do. And I want y'all, if you didn't watch them, I want you to watch them. Uh, say they are good videos. I don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll watch them together. I'm not going to watch these two because we've already watched them. Um, moving forward, we'll watch them. Okay. <laughs> Aww. I just thought about, you know, big old church in the back of the room with his mouth open saying something dumb. Man, God, I miss you guys. Oh, oh gosh. K squared, where are you at? What, what? All right, sorry, sorry, sorry. A major threat to food security in some of the world's water short dry lands is desertification. And understand that this is a bad juju. 
So the process in which productive potential of topsoil falls by 10%, and usually it's a drought, right? And usually the humans are blamed for the drought. Oh, snake. <laughs> I'm so close to it. All right. So we have dry lands in the United States, right? Uh, we don't have them here, but we have them there. And don't pick this guy up. Like, he is not messing around. Uh, we did get to the Dust Bowl in class, and it was terrible, I'm sure. Uh, I am old, but I am not that old. So I do not remember the Dust Bowl. Seems pretty bad. Watch the video. Okay. So in 2012, for most of us, we talked about there are two potential Dust Bowls coming up. Now, clearly that was eight years ago. So I encourage you to look and to see if these dust bowls are still happening in these locations. Okay, oh, look at all the sheep. Okay, another way to degrade topsoil is to deplete it of key plant nutrients, and clearly we are depleting it by those daggone sheep and lamb and goats and cows. They're all eating, right? So, um, Again, you're going back to how much does it cost? How much can I get from it? How poor am I? Um, you know, we're talking about people that want to provide for their families. So they can either over farm it and not have the ability to replenish those, those very important chemicals and nutrients that we need. Or you just let your livestock just eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it. And, you know, we're sometimes we humans are more worried about the immediate payoff than the long term payoff. Soil salinization. And again, I may put extra syllable in that word and I apologize if I did. I, I, I just I don't know that I have ever seen this in, in our region. And, and again, I just could be, you know, poor old Miss Gimme Horn. She just don't get out much. She needs to get out on the four-wheeler and, you know, do, do her little yee-yee thing. But I, I don't remember if I have seen this. So understand that what we typically have is <laughs> we either have water that has come up. So it's coming up into our fields and then that water's holding there. And then as it recedes or it gets evaporated off, it leaves behind all of the more solid molecules. So in this case, salt. Um, and then that salt hangs out. And I, I feel like in class we talked about, you know, a good quick way to kill your plant is to put a little salt on it. You know, they're not like fries. A little extra salt does not go a long ways in this situation. So it could ruin your farmland if you have a lot of that. Now, I want to say that if you have soil salinization, one of the answers to it is waterlog your field, which again, not a farmer. Like, how do I get this, y'all? It sounds very, very complicated and very, very scary. Like, hey, you know what the answer to drowning is? Why well, jump in the water? I feel like that is not always the right answer, but think about it, you know, right? We're gonna flesh it out. Um, in this case, you've got all this salt sitting on top of the ground, and so it's killing your crops. So flood that dude and see if we can't flush it out, right? The answer to pollution is dilution, always. So we have definitely seen this uh, when the Ohio gets out of her banks. You know, she is, she is an angry lady sometimes, y'all. And um, I, I, like I said, I remember Uncle Jerry said he planted three times last year. And, you know, that would make me nervous. That I, I would not be happy with that. So perhaps the biggest problem resulting from ex excessive irrigation is that it's contributed to that depletion of the groundwater. So it's kind of like this toilet paper thing we got going on. Like nobody needs that much toilet paper. I don't understand. And like you want to scream, stop. And then... You turn around and everybody's buying toilet paper. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, wait, what? What if I need toilet paper? Well, I better get mine because they're going to get theirs. And so these farmers see, you know, Fred and, you know, Cody. And they're both using this, you know, underground water source 
to irrigate their farms, and then they're like, well, I'm going to use it to do mine too. And then the next thing you know, we've overused it, and it may not have maximized the plant growth. So we've got to really be careful with our water supplies around the world. And I don't think this is a problem we have. I think this is more not here kind of problem. Now, doesn't that just make you sad? I don't even know. Like, why on God, uh, God, the God of understanding, or lack thereof, y'all, we're, uh, listen, you're just going to have to help me out here. Like, I don't, I don't even know what to say about that. Okay. So, agriculture contributes to air pollution and climate change. I have been telling you, if you do one thing from this class, it is to plant a tree. They are like, God, the God of your understanding, or the lack thereof. Like little gifts to us, or big gifts to us, right? So when we burn and we clear, um, it just, it really doesn't, it just doesn't do a good job. And I feel like everybody else is waiting for like the next guy to do the next right thing. But that's not, that's not the deal, right? Like we got, we got to all do the next right thing. Like don't go all, buy all the daggone toilet paper. Um, I don't even know. Like, well, honey, like, why, why are you buying toilet paper? I gotta get off of that. Okay. See, if y'all were here, you'd help me. Ah, for Pete's sake. Okay, look. Deep, deep breath. Livestock, long shadow. Now, here we're getting into areas that I don't know. Well, we got a lot of areas I don't know. But if I play this video, I don't know if I can talk over it or not. Um, so... The problem is, huh, Chad just texted me. He wanted to know how Armageddon's going. Great. Um, so, I'm going to play it, and then I might talk. Uh, and again, who do I love? I love the farmers. All right? So, we just we have to remember that going into this. Industrialized livestock production generates about 18% of the world's greenhouse gases. This is according to our book. So, remember, um, the methane that the cows are burping and farting are, no bueno, 25% worse than carbon dioxide. I think this is that cartoon. We may have watched this. Um, I'm going to see what happens on this monitor. Oh. Hey, did you know that our global food system is responsible for almost a third of all greenhouse gas emissions? Food production is the main cause of these emissions, but transportation and refrigeration are also big contributors. At this rate, these emissions will eat up half of the world's carbon budget in just 30 years. The biggest contributor to emissions is the livestock sector, particularly beef production. Livestock produces 14.5 of all human-caused GHG emissions, and nearly half of this is from feed production and processing. In fact, 33% of arable land is used to grow feed crops. In South America, feed crops such as maize and soybeans are grown at the expense of tropical forests, which are home to some of the most valuable ecosystems in the world. Beef requires 160 times as much land as plant staples like potatoes, wheat, and rice combined, and causes 11 times as much GHG emissions and 19 times as much nitrous oxide emissions. It takes 37 calories of feed to produce one calorie of beef, and 800 calories of feed to produce one gram of beef protein. That's a range of 3,000 to 20,000 calories of feed for every single hamburger. Along with international policy action, solutions are as simple as reducing our meat consumption to a recommended maximum of two times per week. In fact, what we eat makes a much bigger difference than how far the food has traveled. If we consider emissions as one of the key factors of our food choices, we could actually reduce GHG emissions by a third by 2050. Bon appétit! <laughs> Yay! Figuring it all out. That's right. Yes, I am. Okay. It's just really awkward to watch myself. Um, watch myself. And then know you're watching me. Watch me. I don't know. It's a lot. 
All right. So, the Cerrado. That's that's where we're at. I feel like this is pretty close to where we got. So, um, food and biofuel, biofuel production has caused major losses of biodiversity. Again, visually, when you see biodiversity, all right, uh, um, so loss of biodiversity, you should be saying, hmm, uh, one of the fastest growing threats to the world's biodiversity is the cutting and burning of large areas of tropical forest in Brazil's Amazon basin and the clearing of the Cerrado. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Uh, so this is the Cerrado, and Emily says she thinks you can hear it. This is the Cerrado in Brazil, and this is its story. The Cerrado is one of the most incredible places on Earth. It's home to some of our most important rivers, most diverse grasslands, and most fascinating creatures, like the giant armadillo, the giant anteater, and the maned wolf. It's vital to our planet's biodiversity, but it is disappearing fast. And the farming of soy fed to the animals we eat is a big part of the problem. Half of the Cerrado has already gone. If we don't act soon, we will lose it completely. We can help stop this happening. You can help by asking your retailer to buy only soy that is produced responsibly and doesn't cause deforestation. The future of the Cerrado is in our hands. All right. So we are cutting and burning to make room for plants that we do use to create biofuels. And we've talked a lot about that in here about, you know, we're asking people to not grow intensive farms that would support themselves so that they can grow this mess. And like here we are in America running around with our biofuel this and our biofuel that feeling good about ourselves when, you know, the Cerrado is being cut down. And that does not make me feel good about myself. Um, I'm all for, like that clearly looks like he could be here in Davis County. I'm all for that. Like that's your choice and you are planting these things for us, then that's fantastic. Um, I don't want you cut down, you know planet slungs just because you know we need to make a little quick buck that slash and burn that is that is not good y'all so it says indonesia is losing tropical rainforest for plantations of oil palm trees uh used to make biofuels again no that's the wrong way all right so here we're starting to get into agrobiodiversity and i know y'all that we are talking about erosion and it's terrible and the thought of like talking about erosion again uh, i'm telling you i super I'm super pumped, uh, but now we're getting into some cool stuff as far as I'm concerned because we had all of these plants, and I can remember, like, when I was little, you know, mullet, little, little fat skimmy, and uh, Nanny would talk about the seeds, and we were going to plant uh, this, you know, I don't even know what kind of corn we were going to plant, but I guarantee you it was going to be a lot because uh, corn is good. And then, uh, and, and you know, you just bought all this different kinds. It never crossed my mind that we are like, they're like honing us down into just a few strands of corn or any kind of crop. So you guys already understand completely that if we only have one kind, biodiversity, right? So anything can wipe it out. Uh, so instead of diversifying we've done the opposite and we've let about 10 varieties now i did not know india when i first started teaching this class was big on rice like they were there are huge rice people i don't know why i didn't know that um you know probably same reason i don't know a lot of stuff but rice india who knew um so this, your book is projecting that it may come down to just one or two varieties. Now, here's the thing, guys. Remember, if a bunch of freshmen and Miss Kimmy Horn can figure out this is not a good plan, then let's all just pray to God, the God of your understanding or the lack thereof, that somebody is going to not do that. Um, you know, that just can't sound good. Um, in the past, 
Uh, you would save seeds. I feel like Nanny put them in her freezer. I don't really know. Um, I was more interested in the ice cream in the freezer than I was in seeds. Um, she had a cellar. She might have kept them down there. Uh, but the companies are not messing around with you anymore. So sometimes if the, if you buy seed and the company has put a patent on them and they catch you growing it year after year, then you get in big trouble and you end up in those lawsuits we talked about earlier. Um, but I think more than that, they have just bioengineered them to where they just won't grow like that. I think they're, you know, they are good for this long and then they just degrade um, to keep you from doing it. Okay, this is so cool. This is one of my favorite. This makes me feel good. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we need to be going towards. So this is our seed library. This is going to save us all. I just got to figure out how to get in. Here I am on Svalbard. It's an archipelago, 800 miles from the North Pole. There are polar bears and glaciers and also the most amazing genetic library I've ever seen. Hey guys, Trace here for DNews. Thanks for tuning in. If you've never heard of Svalbard before, it's this place right here. Way up on top of the planet, far away from civilization, but Svalbard might be one of the most important places in the world. It's really cool, and we get to go inside. You know, this is quite simply a, a hole in the mountain. <laughs> in there, you have actually 13,000 years history of agriculture. It's quite amazing. That's Marie Haga. She is the executive director of the Crop Trust, the group that oversees the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Inside that vault are boxes, and inside those boxes... Seeds! Quite simply seeds. So normally somewhere between 300 and 500 seeds in these aluminum foils envelopes. And that's all there is. Nothing else. What is unique in Svalbard is that we collect seeds from absolutely all over the world, or countries, or institutions choose um, to use this as a backup facility. The main reason it's so far north is because Svalbard is cold. It's got a permafrost, meaning the ground never really thaws even in the summer. Most seeds um, can be stored long term at minus 18 degrees, or they can keep for a long time at, uh, at a temperature that isn't that uh, cold either. Um, but that's sort of the perfect temperature. By digging a 130-meter tunnel deep into the mountain, the vault is underneath that permafrost, meaning they only had to cool it the remaining 12 Celsius. At that temperature, the 860,000 varieties currently in the vault can be held for decades. Some wheat varieties could last a thousand years. But aside from serving as a backup for the global food machine, the seed vault also represents something else, a genetic library of evolutionary successes. Wheat originates in well, certainly the Middle East. Now we grow wheat absolutely all over the world. The thing is that it has taken many thousand years for these plants to move around the globe. The challenge these days is really that the climate changes so fast, so the plants are not able to adopt. And that is really the fundamental challenge for agriculture these days. And we need to help these plants to adopt faster. And that is why we need to introduce, for example, genes from a wild relative that can make sure that wheat can grow in funny climates with, for example, less water, or that it's able to fight a new disease that stems from climate change. So scientists are traveling the world to gather more seeds and bring those into the vault too. Because farmers don't want to grow all these crops in their fields because they need to make dollars. And they and agribusinesses will grow for yield. But when we choose yield over diversity, we lose genetic variety. We in the U.S. only have about 10% of the variety of fruits and vegetables that we had 100 years ago. So if a disease strikes, say, bananas, like is happening now, they could go extinct. They all have the same immune system, and there's nothing we can do. There aren't any other varieties to experiment with which is why we're cataloging and saving seeds in this vault. There are 3,000 varieties of coconuts, 4,500 varieties of potatoes, 35,000 varieties of corn, 125,000 varieties of wheat, or 200,000 varieties of rice. One of those might have the trait that we need in the future to adopt rice to whatever it is, higher temperature, 
higher salinity in the soil, more unpredictable weather, a variety that can fight a new pest or a new disease. And for each one we lose, we lose options to develop plants with traits in the future. In the end, the seed vault isn't just a place where seeds wait to be genetically sequenced and grown again to secure our food supply for the next 9 or 15 billion people who live on the earth in the future. It's also a library of nature's trial and error from the past for dealing with the shifting planet that we live on. And it's one of humanity's greatest science projects. It's ongoing, it's complicated, and it's just plain awe-inspiring. Okay, so now you know why we need the seed vault. But what about for foods that don't have seeds? How did they get that way? Are they some kind of weird Frankenstein hybrid? Not always. It happens naturally from time to time. Check out this video and find out how we got seedless foods. In botany, breeding seedless fruit is called parthenocarpy. Parthenocarpic fruit can often naturally occur due to mutations or problems with sperm and egg fertilization or through specific hybrid breeding, mixing plants with more or fewer. All right. Um, don't y'all want to go there? Like, for real, y'all. That, it would, that would be so cool. Um, I, and I have questions, of course. Like, okay, so they can't stay in the Svalvard for forever, so are we going to take some out and plant them and, like, like, renew it? Who's on that committee? Who's in charge of that? Um, are there taste testers? I don't know. Like, all oh, sounds super cool. Maybe some of y'all can go work there and invite me. Like, I don't know. Like, I just feel like it'd be cool to be there. Like, literally cool, to be cool. But like, cool, right? Um, of course, there's controversy over genetically engineering food. So I feel like that ignorance is your biggest obstacle. Like, as is in all things. But I just, I. I don't know. Maybe it's my ignorance, right? Um, I don't think that it's a big deal. I think it's a good thing. Um, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Like, firm tomatoes. I, I, those are the only kind I eat. Um, you know, like big, the big old ears of corn that, you know, you did the whole, like, you know, that, 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 yeah, that's good stuff. Oh, now see, I found this picture, and I was like, Frankenstein, Franken food. And this, you know, again, just pictures are supposed to cause you to have emotions. So, they're kind of trying to say that uh, this Franken food is going to take over, and it's going to destroy the food that we have, and that's, you know. I just don't think that's going to happen um, again. So, here's our trade-offs for genetically modified versus not genetically modified. So, and I would say that this, this comes out of your book. I feel like you can feel this in your book. So, the advantages, less fertilizer, less water, more resistant to all the awful things. They grow faster. They're going to be bigger, less pesticides, may reduce energy needs like don't you feel like whoever made this list like completely was like, no, GMOs are good. And um, the disadvantages listed here are unpredictable, harmful toxins and new allergens in food, no increase in yields, more pesticide resistant insects and herbicide resistant weeds are going to appear, could disrupt the seed market, and low genetic diversity. So, my awesome little scientist, I want you to read these lists and I, I don't want you to say, you know, one's right and one's wrong. I want you to say, I feel like it's been written with a little bit of biasness, and I bet that there are, um, you know, more to the story than this right here, than they're trying to say. So, we talked about the Green Revolution. Remember, how many Green Revolutions did we have? Oh, that's right, church. We had two. Good answer. So, if we hadn't had this, we wouldn't be here. Um, when you think about... Again, just statistically, if the human population dwindles, like it would have to, without the Industrial Revolution, the Green Revolution, don't forget the Blue Revolution, um, the likelihood that both your parents and their parents would have all been born um, and lived in places where they could meet, I feel like it's like not, not, good, not good odds. 
that we would be who we are here today without the Green Revolution. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say, I think it's a good thing. Uh, again, fat kid, uh, bit like a Lego, I like to eat, uh, all those things are true. Now, it says without huge inputs of water and synthetic inorganic fertilizers and pesticides. Now, we just need to pause right there because synthetic, remember that means man-made, but in this class, it's kind of like a little curse word there for you. So, you got synthetic, then you got inorganic, which means, uh, you know, right, like not carbon-based, not good. Fertilizers, that's the F word. Like, there's just a bunch of foulness right here. Um, <laughs> pesticides. Right? Most green revolution and genetically engineered crop varieties produce yields that are no higher and sometimes lower than the traditional strain. So what they're saying is, if we hadn't have done all of this, if we hadn't have put in all the water, if we hadn't put in all the synthetic fertilizers, then it had ended up being the same thing. So what they're trying to push you to the conclusion is, could we go back and use our non-genetically modified seeds and get the same thing done. I don't know. Okay, now, this guy, all right, so here's the thing. This John Robbins, he is Nike. So I looked him up because I was, you know, looking stuff up, and this whole thing is about naked food, naked lifestyle, like not naked, like naked, but naked, like his book cover, it, you don't see anything. Like, Oh, I know. Stop. Don't touch me there. That's my no no square. So, you don't know that. But um, this guy, if you look him up, you'll see the front of his book. He does not have clothes on. Um, Matt Robbins says, Oh, not Matt Robbins. <laughs> his name is John Robbins. It's close. Uh, you'd save more water by not eating a pound of California beef than you would by not showering for a year. Like, again, shower, I got questions, I, I want to know, um, how long are your showers, Brianna, um, I, how's he showering, I don't know, and is it just California beef, like, I, I don't know that I've ever had California beef, I feel like my beef, you know, spoke with a good southern twang, so, you know, I'm, ooh, not beef, so, maybe that doesn't apply to us. So analysts also point out that meat produced by industrialized agriculture is artificially cheap because most of its harmful environmental and health costs are not included in market pricing. Remember, this is full cost pricing, which we talked about. So they're not telling you how much all this stuff costs to our globe. They're just saying we've done this much. And also remember, we talked about subsidies, um, the government's help. In keeping the cost down, uh, let's say cap and trade. All I don't know the cap and trade applies there, but subsidies do for sure. So livestock, uh, we're not watching them kill cows. Um, you know, I, I like to live by the adage. I love to eat the sausage. I don't just don't want to watch it made. Uh, I don't really love to eat sausage, but you know what I'm saying. So. If you got to cut the forest down for grazing, you're eliminating the trees. That's bad. Um, Overgrazing, soil compaction, erosion has degraded 20% of the world's grasslands and pastures. Again, oh, our farmers are taking care of our grasslands. So, um, rangeland grazing and industrialized livestock production cause about 55% of all topsoil erosion and sediment pollution. A third of water pollution is runoff of the nitrogen and phosphorus from the excessive inputs of synthetic fertilizers, large amounts of fossil fuel, and this is from the cradle to the grave. So remember, when we're talking about cradle to grave, we're talking about getting everybody to the farm to inseminate the cow all the way to getting the cow to the slaughter to slaughter the cow. Um, use of antibiotics on our cattle, I, I don't think... Again, not a farmer. I don't think that we want our cattle getting diseases, and that's that's why they're using them. Um, if you can get away with not using antibiotics, I don't know, um, but I would think that the number of head that you would have would be much lower. And then the amount of waste. 
that the American meat industry produces is about 130 times the amount of waste produced by the country's human pollution. And I'm just going to assume that that's, you know, the shoe-shoe that's coming out. And again, nobody has ever, like, measured my poop. So, I mean, oh gosh, Emma, right, girl. All right, look at that fish. What the heck is that? Oh gosh, y'all. Like, I don't even know. Um, I feel like if that thing swam up beside me, I'd just go ahead and die, and good news, bad news, it would probably be longer than I was. All right. Oh, God, but it then eat me. Oh, okay. Anyway, so <laughs> aquaculture can harm our ecosystems, which we talked about with our tuna yesterday. Uh, well, it wasn't yesterday. I know. I can hear you now. Um, it's going to be horn. Yesterday was Sunday. Yes, I know. Um, yeah, I still feel a little weird getting close to that fish. A third of the wild fish caught are used to make fish meal and fish oil that are fed to farm fish. So, you heard that right. They um, are catching the fish to feed the fish. Fish? Seems a little fishy, doesn't it? Um, and this is going to deplete many populations of wild fish that are critical to our marine uh, food webs. So, understand, what must we not mess with? Like, the thing that scares me the most is the water, y'all. Um, I just, in the ocean, like, let's, let's please not mess that up. That's very bad. So, I think you guys are solid at this point about food webs, food chains, and you kind of understand as you take those guys out, what's going to happen. I'm like an aggressive clicker. Oh, biomagnification. Um, oh, this clicker didn't work for this. Okay, so here we go. Now, from this day forward, we're going to talk about biomagnification. You're going to be like, I got you, Skim. I'm going to be like, yes, you do, Jonathan. So um, when wild fish are caught and fed to aquaculture, those wild fish bring with them contaminants from the ocean. So if you'll look at my picture down here, the mayfly is picking up some contaminants. And then the bluegills are eating the mayflies. And then the bass is eating the bluegill. And then the human is eating the bass. Um, and with each step, remember, I told you that it's typically stored in the fat. It's not always, but it's typically stored in the fat. And, like, it just, like, everything that the mayfly eats, you eat. So, if you're a bluegill, every mayfly you eat, you get all of their toxins if they are toxins that they store in their fat. Well, you, you're a bluegill. You don't just eat one mayfly. Like, you eat all the daggone mayflies you can find. And then... Your bass, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really eat fish. I don't know if y'all eat fish, but I'm going to assume that bass just don't eat one bluegill and then go about their ways. I feel like they eat a lot of bass, or I mean, they eat a lot of bluegill. And so that's the idea is it's like, it, you just can't get rid of it. So you store it in your, in your fat and it just moves on. I can't tell if those fish are alive or not. I feel like they're going to jump up out of there and smack somebody in the face, but that's a lot of fish in a circle. Fish farms, especially those that raise carnivorous fish, now that's going to be like a meat eater, which I think most fish are meat eaters, right? Such as salmon and tuna produce large amounts of waste that pollutes the aquatic systems and our fisheries. Um, so, I, look, I know like goldfish, they pee a lot. And so, you know, you kind of want to get plants in there for them to help with the nitrogenous waste. So I think what this is saying is if we, it's, the answer is not just the fish farm, that we also have to understand that the fish farm is going to be putting off a lot of pollutants. So as you're fleshing out your question, well, not your question, but your answer, as you're fleshing out your answer, I need you to be thinking about stuff like, um, okay, I don't see anybody else post any questions you need to be asking yourself stuff like you know could we plant some aquatic plants to offset what they're doing um you know what what kind of filtration's going on because that you know it'll accumulate in that area the toxins will um, ta -da! aquaculture can also though end up promoting the spread of invasive plant species all right so the Asian kelp, so <laughs> called wakame or <laughs> Andaria, 
I, look, I'm freaking out because this is going on YouTube. And there is, like, I don't care to just say some crazy stuff up in here with y'all. But there, you know, oh, Avocado69 is going to be like, um, excuse me, it's called Wakami or something. I don't know. So that's, I don't know. Anyway, so Asian kelp called those two names it's popular food product and it's raised on some farms although this invasive species is disrupting our coastal aquatic systems in several parts of the world it looks like you know it would be delicious um farm fish can escape their pens i know that you all have not watched i think it's called deep blue i may have it over there um i think it's called deep blue it's such a good movie and you guys are stuck at home so at any rate it's this movie where um, they are, like, they're keeping these fish, or not fish, they're sharks. Um, they're keeping these sharks, and so it's top secret, of course. And I think LL Cool J, I, 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 maybe LL Cool J is in it, and they're all female sharks because they don't want them, like, you know, you know, fish loving. And um, it's all underwater because, you know, they're sharks, and they get in there and they start to eat the people up oh, it's so good i i think i'd have a heart attack if i was just trapped underwater with the like these are intelligent sharks i kind of kill you but the reason why i'm telling you all this because at the end of the movie the facility looks like that i mean whatever was in there got out you know um so if you have i don't know like a killer shark that uh surprise ended up being hermaphroditic i think uh we could have some problems you know megalodon maybe it was really a documentary we don't know all right major seed companies are now pushing to use these patented genetically modified soybeans as their primary feed for farm-raised fish and shellfish meaning that they're trying not to you know feed the fish the fish because first of all that's a little harsh don't you think like here you know here's little cousin teddy and um eat up <laughs> i really need y'all here to bounce my crazy ideas off of all right this is increase of water pollution though because the fish that are fed soy products produce even more waste so my future scientists we gotta we gotta find a way to balance that out like i think soy is a good answer but because they're producing more waste right you need to be thinking all right so what can i do with that um, could also encourage more deforestation and loss of biodiversity when soil plant when soy plantations are replacing tropical forests. And again, I don't know who's on that committee, but we're going to vote no to that. All right, here is some salmon. Let me start by saying I don't eat fish. Secondly, this thing looks terrifying to me. Um, I feel like those are like teeth, teeth, which good grief. Um, so there's also controversy over the use of a type of farm salmon that's being genetically engineered through a combination of growth genes from the Chinook salmon and a sea eel to grow quickly in the size of the wild salmon. So they're putting them together, y'all. Researchers are now considering a protected status for a specific breed of salmon. In response, fish retailers are exploring farmed and genetically altered options. Natasha Sweets has the story. Fish consumption is on the rise, but overfishing as well as changes in the environment, including pollution, have caused salmon populations to dwindle. And some may wonder if unconventional salmon will make up the diets of fish eaters. When it comes to cooking, Mario Medina, who's been an executive chef for the past 12 years, says he prefers a more natural approach to his dishes. You can see the difference between farm and wild. Working in the restaurant industry for the past 25 years, Medina says there's no question customers are concerned whether or not their fish is farmed or wild. A lot of them, my customer, my guests, come to my place and ask me about it's fresh. Or as, as from the farm was wild. And when I say farm, the people say, no, thank you very much. And Medina thinks he knows why. Why do you think it's more popular? Flavor. Farm salmon is commonly referred to as Atlantic salmon, which is an easier sell on the menu. A difference in texture and artificial dye, Medina says farm salmon needs to have more flavor added to recipes. When it's uh, wild, you can put salt and pepper, grill, pan sear, uh, bake and there's flavor in there because it's automatic, you have flavor. 
then and when it's a farm but it's a lot of chemicals you can you need to put extra sauce, you need to put uh, a lot of things on these fish. As fish consumption is up, a shortage of salmon is causing wild cuts to be pricier than farmed salmon. In fact, researchers are in a 12-month review process specifically looking at the Northwest Chinook salmon population. Once the most abundant fish in the Northwest, some local tribes argue dams are hurting the migration of the fish. While farmed and wild salmon are the two choices now, a third option, genetically modified salmon, was approved for consumption in the U.S. back in 2015. A spokesperson for the Massachusetts-based company behind genetically modified salmon, Aqua Bounty, confirmed to RT labeling was not required when the FDA originally approved our salmon in November of 2015. However, the FDA issued a warning in January of 2016 banning the import and sale of the salmon until labeling guidelines are established. Interestingly enough, Aqua Bounty makes its genetically modified fish from a growth hormone from a Chinook salmon gene, the type of salmon that may be in danger. In the meantime, Aqua Bounty has sold some five tons of genetically modified fish to Canada. And the Canadian government confirms while other genetically modified food must be labeled, Aqua Bounty salmon is not. As the statement says, no health and safety concerns were identified. In the meantime, smell, texture, color, and taste will indicate if the salmon you're eating is Atlantic or wild caught. In Los Angeles, Natasha Sweet, RT. All right, so Maggie's here with us now, thank God. And, oh, Kylie, I can't wait to see you either. Like, seriously, this is terrible. I mean, it's going to be fine. Uh, but Maggie says, Deep Blue Sea, I think she's right. I think that's the movie. Uh, those fish are terrifying. Um, yes. So, I'm trying to watch the feed as I'm talking now. That should cause her some extra facial expressions. Y'all, nobody told me that my face was so busy. Okay, so they took this uh, Chinook and the eels and they put them together to make them grow faster, bigger, better, stronger. Um, but then I found this picture and I was like, wow. Um, so if you look at that, like the genetically modified salmon could eat the, the regular farm salmon and uh, both fish are 18 months old. So that's cool, right? Um, you know, again, I got questions, not a lot of answers. Uh, I'm assuming that there's some eel taste. I don't know. What do eels taste like? You know? Like, do they try to attack you? Like, do you get a zoo? All right. All right. Are these electric kind of eels? Like, I don't know. Oh, God. Somebody's going to be like, no, excuse me, ma'am. Like, you're not electric. Um, we're just going to, you know, Taylor Swift that comment right off. Um, there's a part two, and I was wondering... Why, why do it again if it didn't go well in the first place? That's like something Trevor would do. Yes. <laughs> He'll be like, oh my God, I got an idea. Let's do it again. Right? Oh, we need Caleb there to bounce him out. Okay. Oh, so the good news is um, these fish are sterile, just like in the deep blue sea. Don't, I don't, you know, I don't know, guys. There's all these studies. Um, snakes are fantastic about just like out of nowhere ending up with fertilized eggs. So just saying they're sterile, you got to be sure that that's, that's the real deal. Oh, my gosh, we made it. I mean, I'm sweating. This was a lot of work. Um, so future 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 food which is different than you know uh regular future food future food production may be limited by soil erosion and degradation desertification irrigation water source shortages air and water pollution climate change and loss of biodiversity oh my god hi sadie baker welcome i know sissy i miss you um that's a lot ah okay so I'm going to stop here and um, I'll do a whole nother video for 12-4. Dakota DeGraw. That is fantastic. Thanks, man. Um, so we'll post another video. And I don't know. Look, here's the thing. Uh, I, <laughs> I can just hear Luke Taylor right now being like, Yeah, you did not tell me you were going to go live. 
oh, Luke, I'm sorry. Uh, this was going to be just a practice, and then it just happened. So um, I will try to do better at, you know, like doing my thing at an appropriate time. Not appropriate time. All times are appropriate times, right? I'm supposed to be the boss here. But I'll try to let you know when I go live in the future. There's, I mean, everything's just crazy here today, y'all. Like, I just closed my door and just, I just hope they don't think I'm here. And uh, from here on out, I hope I'm coming to you from a house, which, I mean, at least I'm at home. And uh, maybe some makeup in the future. I don't know. That's high bar right there. And, uh, and it's going to be okay. I've posted stuff on Google Classroom for you guys to check. And, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's your chicken. You pluck it. We got this. Um, so I'm going to try to sign off. I don't know what we're going to do. Crush breakers. Um, stop streaming.